So the reading is John 9, 1 to 12, uh, page 821 in the Pew Bible. Jesus heals a man born blind. As Jesus was walking alone, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Teacher, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it a result of his own sins or those of his parents? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. He was born blind so the power of God could be seen in him. All of us must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent me, because there is little time left before the night falls and all work comes to an end. While I am still here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smoothed the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Is this the same man, that beggar? Some said he was, and others said, No, but he surely looks like him. And the beggar kept saying, I am the same man. They asked, Who healed you? What happened? He told them, The man they called Jesus made mud and smoothed it over my eyes and told me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash off the mud. I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. From 2 Kings 5, 1 to 14. Page 301. The king of Aram had high admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Now groups of Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to carry the king to carry to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out, taking as gifts 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. With this letter, I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read it, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, This man sends me a leper to heal? Am I God that I can kill and give life? He is only trying to find an excuse to invade us again. But when Eliza, the man of God, heard about the king's reaction, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me. And he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elijah's house. But Elijah sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would surely come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the Abana River and the Farpar River of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel put together? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned away and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply to go and wash and be cured. 
So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed. And his flesh became as healthy as a young child's, and he was healed. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> it's no problem. I mentioned to Paul that when I emailed and asked if a MacArthur would read today, it hadn't actually occurred to me that I would end up with a doctor reading two healing passages, but <laughs> God has a funny sense of humor. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for reading. I am Tabitha, but you won't know my name. In your book, I'm only referred to as the servant girl, the maid of the general Naaman's wife. My place in society and my place in history does not require me to have a name. I know where I belong, at the bottom, barely thought of and certainly not consulted for advice. But I liked my mistress. She was kind and she was good, and she cared about name, and even if I couldn't fully always understand why. His sickness, his leprosy, the sores on his skin, they troubled her. Even though he was rich and powerful, even though he was feared by many and was not kicked out of the community like other lepers were, he was impure and unclean and he knew it. And everyone around him knew it. So while he was feared and obeyed, he was not liked and he was not accepted. He was not associated with on any level other than obeying orders given by him. His disease ate away at his flesh and nod at his soul. But I knew of a God who could heal Naaman, and a man of God who could deliver that healing. I knew of a prophet of God in my homeland that could make him well. But who could I tell, and how could I tell them? If I told someone, why would they even believe me, and would they even hear me? And if they did, and they went, and no cure was received, what would happen to me? It weighed heavily on my mind for weeks. It consumed my prayers and my thoughts. But finally, I got up the nerve to speak. One night as I helped my mistress, I spoke up. She was surprised, I could tell, but she thought deeply about what I said because the next day she began asking me questions. When I learned that Naaman was going to see the prophet Elisha, I was surprised, I was relieved, I was nervous. But surely if God had given me the courage to speak, he would deliver a cure. Only time would tell. This morning we are starting a series for the summer on forgotten stories. Stories that are in the Bible that have been included for some reason under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the scripture that we refer to and look to for revelation of God and his acting in the world. And while we often go back to the same familiar stories, we must believe that all of the stories of scripture are there for some reason. And so, uh, prompted by an, an article entitled Weird Stuff That's in the Bible, and there is some weird stuff, I've chosen some stories for us to look at and to ask, what is it that God might be saying to us today through the inclusion of these stories? And so through the perspective of, of that question, we are going to tackle some of these forgotten stories of the Old Testament. So just purely out of curiosity, how many of you sort of recognize the story of Naaman? Oh, good. You had good Sunday school curriculum. <laughs> When we did it in Sunday school a few years ago at St. Andrews, the children loved it. And for ages, when we would go for the church picnic uh, at a farm where we could swim, they would say, look, I'm Naaman, and they'd go seven times in the water and come out. <laughs> they were delighted about it. The story of Naaman is a, is a good one because it really speaks to the human condition and the ways of God in using unexpected people and the wholeness that he brings about. 
At its core, the story of Naaman is about three things. First of all, it's a story about entitlement and power and pride. Naaman is a powerful man, a general. He commands authority and respect, and he is given authority and respect. And that high social status blunted for him the ramifications of having a terrible disease. Now, in the Old Testament, particularly, and, and in the New as well, when they refer to leprosy, it is not necessarily meaning Hansen's disease, which is what we modernly call what, what is modern day leprosy, where you know bits fall off and things? But leprosy was a collective term used for all kinds of lesions and boils and sores and skin diseases that were con contagious, right? Communicable things that you could give to someone else through touch. And so lepers were mandated by the laws of God to be separated from the community for the well being of the community, right? Uh, now, all the social isolation that that led to was you know, people taking a good idea from God and implementing it poorly, like we ever see that happen, right? But, um, and so, but because he was so wealthy and so powerful, he was given a little, he was afforded a little more flexibility around that. So he hasn't been cast out into a colony where he has to yell unclean every time someone comes within a certain number of feet of him. And he is a man who is powerful despite his illness and who controls great wealth. And he believes, it's clear, that showing his power and his wealth can get him whatever he wants. And that certainly seems to be a successful uh, modus operandi for him. Because when he goes to the king of Aram and says, listen, I need to go to, to the Hebrew people, I need to go to the nation of Israel, and I need to, I need to get healed by this prophet, the king says, essentially, well, you know, we are at war with them. We do have this sort of tenuous truce, but sure, name, and if you need that, we'll put the whole nation's safety and security at risk for you. Because that's essentially what he does. He sends a letter forward saying, look at my general sick, make him well. Now, the king of, of Israel at the time obviously thinks this is a test and a trap, right? Because he's like, great, now if I can't heal this man, we're back at war. But Naaman goes with all kinds of wealth. Like as, as Paul was reading those descriptions again of how much gold and silver and 10 sets of clothing, it's not a big deal for us, but at the time, that's like incredible amounts of wealth that this man is taking with him. It is clear that he is expecting that he will be able to buy a cure from Elisha. That, he, that if Elisha is hesitant, he will be able to con, convince him through that. And the pride and the entitlement that Naaman feels continues to be demonstrated through the story. When he finally arrives at the house of this prophet, and Elisha doesn't even come out, but sends someone else to deal with him, Naaman has had it to hear. He is fed up. What an insult. I'm a great general. How come you're sending a servant to tell me to go in that pitiful little river over there and have a bath? Right? He's offended by the simplicity of the cure and by the fact that Elisha does not acquiesce to his power and his wealth. Right? And so it says that he is in a rage. I just have this vision of the general stalking back to his chariot, slamming the door, you know, whew, off he goes, right? He is really unimpressed because his pride has been hurt. His sense of entitlement has been attached, attacked. His sense of power over things has been thwarted. Naaman's sense of entitlement and his pride and his power, his sins of self-importance and excessive self-love, almost prevent him from being healed. They are not the source of his disease. And in John, Jesus makes it clear that sin is not the source of illness. But the sins of Naaman's heart in being entitled and proud and loving his power and thinking it gives him control over all things nearly costs him a cure. It is a significant roadblock in his search for healing because he's not going to do what that simple man has told him to do because it's not good enough or big enough or flashy enough for him. And so this story is very much about the entitlement and the power and the pride of Naaman. But this story is also about unlikely heroes, or more specifically about how God uses unlikely people 
to bring change in our lives and in the world. The story clearly shows that the ways of the God of the Hebrew people runs counter to the system of power and entitlement that Naaman was used to in a neighboring nation. Because it is a servant, humble, unseen woman that ultimately leads to Naaman's healing. The message of a servant girl delivered through Naaman's wife, who also would have had more status than the servant girl, but certainly much less than her husband, plants the seed of the idea that healing could come from a prophet of God, Elisha. A slave from the enemy nation, a captive. Now we see a crack in Naaman's fortress of pride and entitlement because he is willing to at least consider the suggestion of this humble and lowly voice. He is willing at least to give it a try and to show up at the, at the, at the house of Elisha to see about a cure. He's open to the information, but doesn't yet show the humility that's needed to receive the cure God is offering to him. But God's desire to humble Naaman is seen in that very moment that leads to him becoming more enraged, that moment of a messenger coming and delivering a simple set of instructions to wash himself seven times in the Jordan River. The number seven to us just sort of, we just sort of gloss over that. It's a fact. He said seven times. But in the Bible, numbers are very important. We see 40 quite often and seven quite often. The number seven is significant because it represents wholeness and completion. It is in seven days that God created the heavens and the earth and at the end declared that it was good. And in Jewish thinking, seven is a significant number that represents restoration and wholeness. And so the specific instruction to go seven times into the river, not six, not nine, not three, is important because it hints that there is some wholeness coming and being made possible if Naaman will do what he has asked. And so as he is enraged and striking out, trying to to leave, it's once again those lower than Naaman, his officers, who speak up and say, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Presented with this obvious statement of fact and challenge, Naaman begins to be humbled, and he does as he is instructed. And so this story is about God's use of unlikely people. But it is also a story about wholeness, because the wholeness that Naaman ultimately ends up getting is not just physical in this case, but also spiritual. The healing that Naaman receives comes from a humble and unexpected source and requires him not only to hear the message of this source, but to follow it. His comments about the Jordan River are interesting. Often when we think of a river... We think of a great, big, wide river. If you've been to Richardson's or any of the parks in the area, you know the Saugeen is quite a wide and fairly impressive river. I mean, you can see the other side, but it it gets quite deep in the center. It's a beautiful, it's a nice, big, healthy river. Uh, Or if we think of the Amazon, you know, it's a massive, wide, beautiful river. But the Jordan, this is part of the Jordan River. Wow. Are you feeling a little underwhelmed? Like, that's a stream, right? We have, I have a river like that through my farm. <laughs> we didn't even have a name for it, right? And so Naaman is not only insulted that the prophet won't come out, but like this is to be the source of his healing, this kind of sad little stream that they call a river. It's a desert nation. What does he want? Uh, and so he's quite indignant that he should not have to do this because there are greater and more impressive rivers where he lives. But he does, in humility, get into that river. And frankly, in that spot, would have had to basically lay down and splash water on top of himself if he was going to dip seven times. But after immersing himself seven times in the Jordan River, the scripture says his flesh became as healthy as a young child's, and he was healed. 
And so in verses 15 to 19, which Paul didn't read because I didn't ask him to, we hear that this is the response of Naaman. I'm going to start at verse 15. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God, Elisha. And they stood before him, and Naaman said, I know at last that there is no God in all of the world except in Israel. Now please accept my gifts. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. And though Naaman urged him to take the gifts, Elisha refused. Then Naaman said, All right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place, and I will take it back home with me. From now on, I will never again offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to any other god except the Lord. However, may the Lord pardon me in this one thing. When my master, the king, goes into the temple of the god Rimon to worship there and leans on my arm, may the Lord pardon me when I bow too. Go in peace, Elisha said, and so Naaman started home again. Naaman, having realized that he has been cured in this unexpected way, through the humility of receiving it, confesses a newfound faith in the God of Israel and offers the wealth of his bounty not as a payment now, but as a gift of thanks. In his actions, Elisha makes it clear that God's power is not for sale to the highest and the wealthiest and the most influential bidder. It is a free gift of grace. Naaman returns to Aram a different man with a bunch of dirt to remind him of the transformation that he has had. And so this story is about entitlement at the beginning, the working of God in humble ways in the middle, humility and wholeness at the end. So the question becomes, what do we take from this story for ourselves? And I think our first attempt at answering that begins with, where do we find ourselves in this story? Do we relate most with Naaman, sure that we can have whatever we like, whenever we like it, and yet in need of healing and wholeness on some level? And if we find ourselves there, what is it that blocks us? What entitlements do we have? What sense of power or pride gets in our way? Or do we find ourselves in the place of the slave girl or the officers, knowing that something great can be achieved if we would speak up, but being unsure about how to or if we should share information that we have? Or do we find ourselves in the place of the prophet Elisha, ministering to the needs of others and pointing glory back to God, doing our best to demonstrate God's love and grace can't be earned but is a gift? Or perhaps, because if I answered this honestly, we find ourselves in all three of those places, depending on the hour and the day and the week and the month. The good news is that wherever we find ourselves, in the place of Naaman, the slave girl, or the prophet Elisha, we can know that God is there with us, leading us and directing us if we will pay attention. Another way to approach this story is to ask ourselves, what is the good news that we find in this story? We often read in the Bible, in the New Testament, the gospel according to Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, which is really a way of saying the good news according to those people. And what is the good news according to Naaman? What is the gospel in this story? I believe it is that liberation from sin will look different for each in each of our lives, but is something that God delights in giving. God can, can transform us, even in our proudest and most self-important and self-sufficient moments, if we will humble ourselves. But the good news of Naaman for us in this story is that none of us are beyond God's transformation if we open ourselves in humility to receive it. And I think there is in this story a call to be courageous, to be people who recognize that God may indeed be desiring to use us in ways we have not expected. I'm sure that the girl whom I named Tabitha for the sake of interest did not wake up thinking, today I'm going to save the general Naaman by speaking the truth. 
I'm quite sure she never expected to play that role. And I'm quite certain that the officers didn't think, today we're going to challenge our general and put our lives at risk, because why not? I'm positive that was not what they thought. And yet God presents to each one of us all kinds of moments to speak truth and cure and wholeness into the lives of those we love and know, into the culture in which we find ourselves, to be unlikely agents of God's good news. And it is my hope and prayer that for myself and for you, we will be people who recognize and follow God in the moments when he asks us to do unlikely things and to be his unlikely voice in the world. That we would be courageous like the slave girl and officers and offer cure and help and wisdom for the benefit of others. And that in all of this, we would do so with humility as we ourselves seek healing in all of the places that we need it, being willing to do even the simple things God asks in order to receive that healing. It is my prayer that this will be so for each one of us and for us as a community. Thanks be to God. Amen.